Hello, welcome to Basin Safety Consulting and Training. Today we're going to be covering HAZCOM, GHS, Benzene, Norm, and T-Norm from an awareness level, and I promise you it's not going to be as painful as it sounds. We've taken and combined a bunch of different topics that are relative to each other, and rather than doing three or four different training, we're combining them into one to make it simple and easy to digest, and I promise you it is not going to be as painful as it sounds. So we have about five objectives here for the first session of this course. Uh, we're going to be talking about HAZCOM first. We're going to learn what it is, how to protect yourself from hazardous chemicals, know how to use something called the ERG guide or emergency response guide, also knowing how to use the SDS, also known as a safety data sheet, and understanding your right to know about the chemicals you work with in your workplace. Makes sense, but still needs to be trained on. All right, this is not a dangerous goods course. Uh, that is a completely separate course that we also offer. Deals with shipping, uh, packing types, uh, a lot more detailed information in the DOT realm. This is a hazardous communication course. Essentially, the way that we communicate about the chemicals that we work with to our workers in the workplace. So uh, hazardous substances obviously exist. We use them for solvents, cleaners, um, and different types of industrial processes. They're around. We use them. But they can make you sick. Um, they can cause cancer, physically harm you in different ways. And so HAZCOM is a part of a much bigger program known as the Globally Harmonized System. So HAZCOM's been around for a long time. Uh, GHS has only been around for about eight years now. Uh, GHS is essentially the international way that we communicate hazards about chemicals. We do that in a very clear pictographic way rather than just writing it out because, let's be honest, not everyone speaks English. Uh, they may someday, uh, but for right now they don't. So we use these symbols, and we'll go through them more later, to you know, essentially showcase what hazards uh, exist with that chemical from a distance. Right? You can walk up to a chemical, see an explosive label on it or an explosive icon, and be like, hey, you know, that's explosive. I should probably not be smoking over here, and uh, go ahead and turn around and take your cigarette outside. Uh, <laughs> HAZCOM is known as the right to know, Law. And the reason for that is it's really about communicating to your people what is in a chemical, how that would affect you, how to, you know, essentially if it catches fire, catches fire, put it out, if it spills, how to clean it up. These are things that are important to know if you're working around dangerous chemicals. If you're a YouTube guy and I'm a YouTube guy, you, you get sucked in sometimes and you'll see videos about, you know, disasters, chemical disasters. Uh, OSHA, you know, there's this great Instagram page, OSHA is this safe, highly recommend you just see people doing stuff, and you're like, oh, my God, why would they do that? Now, <coughs> some people choose to do the wrong thing, but we want to make sure that people have the right information. So if they want to do the right thing and keep themselves safe, they have that information. So you have the right to know. Uh, this is combined with the global system, even though OSHA is a more federal, uh, localized United States program. And essentially, we're bringing the world together when it comes to chemical safety because you should know what you're working with and, uh, again, how it affects you uh, and the physical environment around you. So this is, you know, we're going to be talking about labels. HASCOM has, you know, four or five different pillars, if you will. Um, essentially, the labeling is a big part of that. We're going to talk about that. The SDSs, the training that's required of you, keeping an adequate chemical inventory, and then also having a written um, program, a health and safety manual program for dealing with chemicals that you have. So with all of these, again, um, they kind of combine and are a part of HASCOM. So the written program kind of comes first because even though I said it last in the previous slide, because if you don't have a program, how do you, you know, hold yourself accountable to a system for protecting employees? This is going to deal with how we, you know, take in new chemicals, uh, where we put the SDS book, where we store chemicals, how we store chemicals, how much of a chemical we're going to store. All that's going to be in the HAZCOM program. It's not necessarily in this program going to give you specific details about every chemical that you have. That's more the SDS book, but it is going to give you an overall picture of, you know, how we deal with chemicals, how we train our people on the chemicals we have. If we no longer are using a chemical, how do we remove that from the inventory and communicate that effectively, etc. All right, so chemical inventory, I mean, it, it is what it sounds like. I don't want to overcomplicate this. You get a chemical in, you put it on a list, hey, we have this chemical in the shop. Uh, that list should be up to date. It should be thorough. Um, and then, you know, not probably not a bad idea if you have those lists. Maybe find a way to highlight the real dangerous stuff. Uh, not required. You know, I'm just kind of throwing this out there. But 
you know, highlighted in the book where this one's yellow or red or orange or, you know, uh, five different colors to communicate that it is a dangerous chemical. So, and this goes for all chemicals. And yes, it sounds ridiculous, but officially even for like things like hand soap, uh, toilet bowl cleaner, Windex, things like this that you think, well, why do we need that here? Well, if you have any toddlers around that have drank Windex thinking it's Gatorade because you could have put it in a Gatorade bottle, not that I've ever done that, but if, if, if you ever find yourself in that situation, you know why this is a good idea. Don't worry, no, I don't have any kids and that's never happened to me, but it has happened in the world. It's a very uh, real and kind of sad uh, uh, instance, but it has happened in the past. So, labels. Um, <coughs> obviously, for a toddler, labels aren't going to mean a whole lot. But for those of us that are, you know, uh, uh, literate, they're important. Um, and even if you're not, they even have images, uh, pictograms, that show us the hazards of those chemicals. So, you know, the labeling requirements used to be a little bit loose, right? It's like, well, if it's bad, say it's bad. Well, what specifically do you have to say on the label? Do you have to say that it's explosive? Do you have to say that it's toxic? Do you have to say that it's corrosive? And so people kind of interpreted their own um, you know, way with these labels. So the GHS program kind of gave a very specific guideline for what needs to be on a label, um, how much should be on that label, especially involving toxic chemicals. Now you're not typically going to see this on, you know, again, hand soap. Um, but, you know, you know, with a, a chemical such as a Crowian, I like to use this as an example, that literally if, if like a gallon of this stuff uh, gets spilled, you and it's like within a mile of a town, the entire town should be evacuated. You know, probably not a bad idea to put a label on it, right? Like, hey, you spill this, you know, the, the, the whole town that you're near, get everybody out of here. You know, it's, it's that bad. Labeling is a great idea, especially, again, for more dangerous chemicals. I want to put this in correct context, right? But also secondary containers. Um, if, and what that means is if I take a chemical from a drum and put it into a spray bottle or into a smaller, um, you know, a smaller one-gallon bottle or something because it's more usable that way, I have to label that secondary container the same way I labeled the original container, right? So if it's, again, a, a chemical like a Crowley, and you can't say, oh, I took it out of the drum, and put it in this spray bottle, now it's not as dangerous, and people don't have a right to know that it's dangerous. You see how I did that? I kind of weave that in there. Okay, moving on. Like I said, we're going to make this painless. All right, uh, pictograms. So <coughs> a couple quick things about the pictograms. Pretty pretty straightforward. You look at them, you're like, all right, you know, I see the, uh, I see the fish dead um, on the dangerous to the environment. Pretty much that's, you know, obviously dangerous to the environment, right? Uh, the compressed gas cylinder, pretty straightforward, flammable. You're going to look at that. Yeah, that's fire. That's a problem. It's probably a fire issue. Uh, a couple of these that people get wrong, uh, they forget the oxidizing one. Um, oxidizing essentially means when it mixes with air, it ha it reacts in some way. And it can be fire. Um, it can be it can become toxic. It can become corrosive. There's a lot of different things. But the, the O with the fire on top of it, just remember, oxidizing. In a similar fashion, uh, another one that people get uh, mixed up or don't know is the exclamation point. So what I like to do is think of that exclamation point as an upside down I for irritant, right? So we have irritant, all right? Harmful irritant. The last one that people get confused is the health hazard. A lot of a lot of people say, and they get it mostly right. They look at it and they say, oh, it's something wrong with the guy's lungs. It's probably an inhalation hazard or, you know, don't breathe this in, which is usually the case. True. Aspiration is the most commonly, is the most common route for a health hazard. You breathe something and you shouldn't. But overall, you see a person, it means anything related to health. So it could be, you know, bone cancer, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, leukemia. Um, but these are the nine different pictograms that we use for GHS. So you see these on something, you know, hey, that is probably not something I want to be, you know, bathing in. OSHA, <coughs> again, this has been around for a long time. They have a bunch of good, quick cards. And I know if you're like me, you're up late Saturday night, you know, you're like, you know what, man, I'm feeling pretty crazy. I'm going to look at some OSHA quick cards. You know, I get it. You know, you probably don't have any friends just like me. But no, if, if you do want to have access to this information, it's available on OSHA's website. You search OSHA quick cards, GHS. There's a bunch of good information on there. It gives direction on how to do this appropriately. So if your company's like, man, how do we, we're all about it. When we want our people to know what's the process. These make it very simple and easy to do so. All right, some other labels I have out there. I'm going to go through these. Uh, this is the, the diamond. It's called the NFPA 704 label. NFPA and OSHA are very different. Uh, NFPA is kind of what we call like a, an industry uh, best practices group or a para-industry group. It's not necessarily 
uh, a federal group, but they do work closely with them. So OSHA, if they don't have specific requirements, they're going to reference the NFPA. Uh, most fire stuff is that way, actually. If you, for example, do service on a fire extinguisher, you need NFPA training. It's a whole thing. I'm not going to get into it. Again, going to make this painless. So the numbering system here is from zero to four. Four being the highest hazard. And I'm not going <coughs> to go super in-depth here, but you know, four means deadly on the health side. We're focusing on health today. Three is extreme danger. <coughs> Two is hazardous. One is slightly hazardous. And then zero is normal material or nothing. And usually we just leave that one blank. So that's how you use this. These are also affixed on buildings with chemicals to, to tell firefighters, for example, emergency responders. You know, they can see this usually about 15 inches, like a big uh, pictogram, with the most dangerous chemical inside. So as they're coming up it, and they see a four and a f on the on the fire hazard and a four on the health hazard, they're probably not going to go in their guns blazing before they know what they're coming up against. Because some things, you spray water on it, and again, oxidization, there's uh, oxygen in water, you're going to have a big explosion. So it's important to know what you're coming up against. And again, just another reason to label things. Again, there's another OSHA quick card on this. If you're curious, Saturday night, man, just feeling crazy. You know, you just got to get something out of your system. Then, yeah, you can look this up and you know, have a really, really fun Saturday night. <coughs> All right, there's another label out there um, for mostly regarding PPE. I like it. It's the HIMIS um, standard, which is Canadian. No, you wouldn't typically say HIMIS. It is not very easy to remember, <coughs> but it's it's helpful. Uh, essentially it uses a lettering system for the level of PPE that you need. A being the you know least amount of PPE, typically just some safety glasses or goggles, all the way up to K, which is full blown you know suits, breathing apparatus, apron, gloves, you know uh, safety helmet, I mean, everything. So you see a K on a chemical, you know in Canada uh, with the NFPA 704 kind of combined, and you're going to be like, okay. I'm not messing with that chemical um, unless I have the right stuff on. Uh, same thing with cleaning up spills. If there's a spill and you don't know what the chemical is, don't just you know start spraying water on it or you know putting some kitty litter down. Like you should know <coughs> how it reacts with different things before you clean it up. So make sure you're trained before you clean it up. That's in the Hazwopper world, hazardous waste uh, emergency responder uh, operations and emergency response. Um, fantastic class. Again, that's for a different day. So um, the alternative labels are essentially used as an additional label to just kind of help quickly identify, you know, what kind of PPE do we need? You know, is this flammable? Is it, is it corrosive? Do, can we not mix it with water, et cetera? Just a quick way to determine uh, the hazard of a chemical. All right, one other labeling system we use is the UNID number. Now this is with, and again, we have a course for this. So yes, again, being the safety guy, lots of friends, you especially start bringing this up at parties like, yeah, man, let me tell you about the UNID numbers for these chemicals here. You know, <coughs> not a very popular topic in case you're wondering and trying to make friends. Um, anyway, the UNID numbers are uh, associated in the Emergency Response Guidebook. You can look up a chemical by the number, um, and it's going to give you some very specific information. It's going to direct you to the name of that chemical, and then it's going to tell you the, how to you know, clean it up, how far you need to evacuate people if it's released into the atmosphere, onto the ground, etc. We have a video on this. I'm going to skip that really quick. Um, hopefully, book as I mentioned. Uh, there's actually a new version of this, uh, 2020, uh, but we're not going to go through it so too de in depth. So for our purposes, the 2016 one will be fine. Uh, there's four different color coded sections, and those different sections correspond to the danger of the chemical. So the yellows, uh, the yellow color, you can look up the n the name, or excuse me, by the number you can find the name. Then you're going to take that name and then look it up at a look it up in the blue category and then go to the orange um, uh, to determine you know what you should do to respond to it as an emergency response person or as a concerned bystander. And again, for you, if you're ex you know busy you know weekend warrior type Saturday night, you can download the app and look through all the different elements of this. It's actually pretty cool. <coughs> yeah, cool. I know it's probably not the right word to use, but it's cool. You can type in a chemical number, a chemical name, and then see everything about it. You know, um, for example, a corollian, if you were to look up that chemical, and I recommend it, you know, because no one has anything to do with their free time, uh, you're going to see, yeah, man, if this if this chemical is released accidentally, we need to uh, evacuate this city. Like, everybody's gone. Same things with things like ammonia, um, anhydrous ammonia, which is pretty common up here in the, in the rural uh, part of North Dakota. There was actually a huge 
anhydrous ammonia spill in Minot a few years back, and people are still sick from that, you know, because um, it's kind of a valley and it's a heavier chemical. So these things do have uh, purpose, importance, and it's it's good to be aware of, and especially before you again go help or clean something up, know what you're dealing with before you do that. <laughs> All right, another quick video we're not going to go through. I feel like I covered it pretty well. Um, so, and these, you know, these safety videos, we're we're actually, I'm just going to put this shameless plug in here. We're creating a new type of safety video called Safety Shorts. Because these safety videos, I'm not going to lie, they're boring, even for me. And I'm kind of a, you know, easily to entertain kind of person. They're, they're terrible. Yeah, I don't know why the 90s was just the decade of safety videos, but most of them were made in the 90s. Uh, they're just bad actors, they're not entertaining, and all you remember is that, that they were bad. You don't, you don't remember anything about the video or like information about it, you just remember they're bad. So anyway, I'm going to digress here, get back to the topic at hand, but yes, we're making some new videos. Keep your eyes posted for safety shorts. They'll be coming to a safety meeting near you soon. Uh, SDSs. So SDSs, safety data sheets, again, the Hascom book's going to talk about it, the chemical inventory is typically going to be tied to it and it's going to give you specific information about each chemical. It used to be known as the, S, the MSDS but in 2014 when they made the switch uh, to GHS that changed so now they're just SDSs. It's going to give you a lot of different information. 16 sections of information and they're uniform. Before 2014 a chemical may have an SDS and they may only have five of these sections or seven or ten and they may be in different orders, right? So you, you have two very dangerous chemicals. On one, you look, you know, section four is going to be firefighting. On the next one, it's going to be section 10 or 9. Um, and so they uniformed it, and this is the order. I'm um, not going to read through it, but just know that there's 16 different sections. And the reason I don't go through it, I'm going to be honest, you're not going to remember all 16 sections. I've been working with this stuff for decades. I still have to look it up. I promise you, if you need to find out which section is which, you can look that up in your HASCOM manual. You can look it up on the OSHA Quick Card. You can look it up on the GHS website, anywhere you want to look, but it is uniform. So section four is always first aid measure. So we'll just put that out there for you. All right, so training is the last portion which we are accomplishing today. This is uh, an awareness training. What do I mean by awareness? It means that this is just a basic overview. I did not go through your company's HASCOM manual today. Um, that's something you can do, again, on your Saturday night. Uh, when you're looking through that, it's going to describe specific processes for dealing with chemicals. I'll be honest, some of these are off the shelf. They're not well vetted. They don't specifically deal with your company. Then update them. You know, talk to your supervisor. Be like, hey, man, let's spend 20 minutes on Microsoft Word. Heck, let's do it on, you know, Microsoft Paint. Let's let's you know, update this this manual and get it specific to our company. Make sure it works. Doesn't need to be complicated, but you know, make sure it's customized to you. All right, again, painless. We're already through one topic few more to go here. Um, we're going to keep it simple. So a couple uh, uh, concluding uh, remarks about this. Hazardous chemicals can be at your work. Make sure you read the SDS to protect yourself. Make sure you're properly trained to work with chemicals and never respond to an emergency if you're not trained. All right. So again, we're going to keep this kind of in a, in a nice vein here. We're going to talk about a specific chemical and go through what that chemical training uh, looks like and what's all involved with it. And that chemical is benzene. So benzene, um, you hear a lot about it. We know it's bad. No one likes it. It's, you know, something, it's negative. But believe it or not, it, it hasn't always been seen that way. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Again, five objectives here, keeping it simple. We talk about how to protect yourself from benzene, the different exposure limits of benzene, what PPE you need, uh, routes of exposure. Again, most common is inhalation and understand how it can affect you in the physical sense. So it, a few basic things about it. It's a colorless liquid, but unlike H2S and, and some other um, you know, chemicals, we consider that a sour uh, smell. This is a sweet smell, so benzene has a nice sweet smelling odor. It's a common component in crude oil, and if we we'll look at the uh, um, chemical composition of it here in a minute and why, that's why it is so common, it's also in gasoline, natural gas, you know, a lot of different products. It's also found in substances like volcanic emissions and cigarette smoke. It's in a lot of places, and, and I'll show you why here in a moment. So the chemical composition of benzene is C6H6. So typically another you know, way that we refer to oil is hydrocarbon, 
And if you look at the chemical composition here, you have carbon and hydrogen. It is, in essence, a hydrocarbon, like a like legitimate, full-on, 100% hydrocarbon. So because of that reason, it loves to live in hydrocarbons, such as oil, gas, and then even all the way into benzene, diesel fuel, etc. It is a carcinogen, uh, causes bone cancer, otherwise known as leukemia, and it can also cause bone abnormalities. And some of these can be passed down genetically, so that's pretty important to note. And as I mentioned, it hasn't always been known as a bad thing. In fact, they used to put it in aftershaves and lotions because it had this sweet natural smell, and it was cheap. You know, it was a byproduct of, of oil, um, so they could use it as a filler and, you know, put it all over your skin and, and smell good. Um, I say that in the you know 19th and 20th century, earlier in those times, but for whatever reason, this just came out recently. They use it actually in sunscreen, and I don't. I think I don't think they like injected benzene into the mix, but because of part of the process, and I don't know who's testing you know banana boat at the end of the day because obviously they had allowed it for public use, but um, yeah, it's part of the process. It actually created benzene. Uh, and we've been putting that on our skin for a long time. So if you're a big sunscreen person, watch out. And there's also a big lawsuit, so maybe you can get it on that. But yeah, benzene's bad, and we've just been, you know, dousing ourselves in it for decades. So keep that in mind. It's also flammable. Uh, the thing about benzene's flammability is we're not dealing with benzene by itself, right? If benzene doesn't magically separate itself from the hydrocarbons that it's in, such as gas and, and oil, it, it's it's a part of it. But the, the unique thing about benzene is the low, lower explosive limit, and the low upper explosive limit. Why is that important? Well, for example, natural gas, right? You propane, ethane, pentane, uh, actually pentane is excluded. Uh, uh, they have a very, they have a higher, not a very high, but a four, typically a 4% mixture with air is the lower explosive limit, meaning you need 4% of an area of natural gas, propane, et cetera, to ignite. So if you only have 3%, you could light a match, nothing's going to happen, you don't have enough of it. The problem here is benzene, if it's in that mixture, if you have 1% benzene mixture in an area, you light a match, you will have an ignition. Same thing with pentane, it also has a very low, it's 1.4%. Again, you know, late cool Saturday nights, that's, how, that's why I know all this stuff. I don't have any notes in front of me even, so it's just, you know, pop anatomy. Again, lots of lots of friends, like so many... Friends, I don't know what to do with them. Uh, <laughs> upper explosive limit is, is also low. Usually they go to about 14% uh, other than H2S, which you remember is 46%. So being that you have so many different competing flammable uh, light ends or, or, or materials inside of natural gas and oil, um, it's, it's kind of difficult to trust one UEL or LEL because they mix together. But it does have a lower explosive limit. That can ignite at a lower concentration and then obviously ignite the other chemicals that are in that in that material, so that's our concern. Um, exposure from the health side. So there's this flammability side on the health side. Um, and I'm not going to lie to you. Um, it's bad. It, 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 we breathe it in, um, goes into the central nervous system, and then that, that hydrocarbon it eventually finds its way to our bones, and it weakens our bones, and it, it causes or abnormalities, and again, cancer uh, if it's there. Most commonly, it's breathed in. Um, some ways that we're going to know before we get the leukemia that benzene exposure is, is we've been affected by it or just <laughs> and the problem is most chemicals have this headaches okay nausea all right convulsions loss of cautious loss of consciousness cancer etc and I'm going to talk about this in our next topic norm and t-norm but if you've had a cold for six months you do not have a cold okay brother you got you got something wrong with you and I know plenty of oil filled hands right they'll they will avoid the doctor. And now we're all running for COVID tests for, you know, I can cut my finger and make sure I don't have COVID. Um, but realistically, like benzene's around. It's it's a hydrocarbon. It is it is the hydrocarbon, CH, C6H6. Um, and exposure to it can cause problems. So if you find yourself sick for a long time, just because the COVID test says negative doesn't mean that you're perfectly fine. Um, there could be something more serious. If you're working or if you're a pumper, if you're a truck driver, if you're a flow back hand, uh, even a work over a guy, not as common, but you can be exposed to this, and over time it's going to cause some problems. All right, again, moving on, going to make this uh, at least painful as possible. Now, this picture, <laughs> I have no idea who put this into my presentation. Uh, it was a long time ago, and I've thought about taking it out every year, but I'm about to every time, and I'm like, I can't. It's, 
it's just it's it's a great example of of like the, just the worst possible like no one's doing who drew this no one's grabbing a a, a a a benzene container up on a shelf with their mouth open looking up i mean it's just not realistic but anyway don't do this just this photo just don't do that um anyway our exposure limits right so number one don't drink it but the pel is so low so over an eight-hour period, you could you should only be exposed to one part per million. I mean, this is this is literally it's it's one drop in about fifteen gallons. All right, so I want you to take picture you know three five-gallon gas tanks on the ground, right, and take one drop and drop it in there. That's the that's the equivalent. So it's super super small um, amount that we can be exposed to in an eight-hour period. So. Over the course of an entire year, if you're to work on it every day, and I'm not even saying this is safe. This is just like the maximum, right, uh, is one part per million. That's like 365 drops compared to, uh, I don't know what, you know, 15 times 365 is probably like the six, 700 range, 700 gallons. It's, a, it's, a, it's an infinitesimal amount. So most tests I've taken in the field for benzene, uh, they give you about, you know, anywhere from 100 to 200 parts just right off. Uh, the thief hatch. You just open that thief hatch, take a benzene test, you're going to get about 100 to 200. So just kind of keep that in mind. And there is some PPE, but it is there. Don't be breathing in the gas. H2S, we talk a lot about that, but benzene is way more common. It's just a little bit more of a slow grind uh, for the pain that it's going to cause rather than instant, such as H2S. So you need to have a plan. You know, what do we do to protect ourselves ourselves from benzene? Uh, what, what kind of protection methods do we have? Where do we stand when we open thief hatches? What kind of ventilation do we have? What PPE do we wear? All these things need to be a part of it, as well as training. All that needs to be a part of it. So um, we're going to talk about some controls here. Administrative controls, these are great. Um, engineering controls, again, are going to you know, be dealing with, dealing with pressure, uh, making sure that vapors stay where they're supposed to or they're uh, routed to the flare. Um, that the well is, you know, killed. We don't have gas just kind of floating everywhere. Those are our typical engineering controls. There's not really a typical chemical program to remove benzene uh, from oil, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, on the administrative side, we have these labels, so you know, benzene. And again, you'll notice some similarities from the HASCOM program. You got your pictograms there on the bottom right of the label on the right, and you'll see, you know, it's a health hazard. Um, it's flammable and it's an irritant. So there is, there are some. Um, things you're going to see before it's things you're going to see and feel before you actually get really sick. So pay attention to your body, know what's going on. Also SDS, you can look up the SDS for benzene, um, you know, what PPE to wear. And I'm going to cover that here in our next slide. So PPE, pretty straightforward. There is, you can wear a half mask, right? So respiration or aspiration is one of our biggest concerns for benzene. So a half mask works actually up to a certain amount of PPM. So about you know, 10 ppm, uh, it's good. Um, up to 100 ppm if it's the right type of cartridge. But over 100 ppm, that's where you have to wear your full face piece. That's when we get in the IDLH atmosphere, a uh, full face piece atmosphere providing uh, respirators such as the ones on the top two photos. So keep that in mind. If you're getting tests of over 100, that's the OSHA recommended um, and NIOSH recommended uh, PPE. So if it gets in your eyes, you know, if you get it liquid, benzene will be one of the things that irritates you. Again, in crude oil or, you know, salt water, where it may be, there's other things that are going to bother your eyes too. So just, just understand that. It's a 15 to 20 minute um, eye wash um, or on your skin um, uh, uh, process. So, you, you know, you want to have those around as well for that reason. All right, testing for benzene, a few different ways that we do it. Um, there's the badges or charcoal tubes. Uh, cartridge method. So we'll actually hook this up into a meter, pull a tube, it'll give us our benzene level and we'll say, hey, you know, this is this is what the benzene level is. Now a lot of times these have little hash marks on the side and they'll give you a PPM or you'll have a digital reader connected to that charcoal tube that'll give you an actual PPM. So that's a cool tool. Um, there's also something called a passive collection beaker or a SUMA canister. It's essentially a stainless steel thing. It looks like a little propane tank. Uh, you put it out in the field, open up the, the valve on it, and it just sucks in the atmosphere, just naturally, passively. And then you close it after a period of time, 15 minutes, 8 hours, 24 hours, send it into a lab. They release that gas and, and test that gas and then say, okay, this is a 24-hour period. How much benzene is a person exposed to? You can also use badges, uh, as I mentioned there, which is a similar model. It's passive. 
collects, you know, the charcoal uh, collects benzene over time. You put it in solution, test that solution, and say, hey, this is how many ppm of benzene someone's exposed to. So, yeah, this is where it gets a little. I'm not a chemistry guy. I know enough about it to bore people at parties, but that's about it. So the uh, there's the NIOSH 1501 rule for this for testing for benzene. Very complicated, but it is around, guys. It's 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 there. There's nothing we can do about it. Be prepared. Know your PPE is necessary. And if if you're concerned, if you're constantly getting sick or sick for a long time, may not be H2S, may not be COVID. It may be benzene. So just putting that bucket in your ear. All right, wrapping this one up. Again, I said I'm going to make this as painless as possible, and that is what I'm going to do. So make sure you're wearing your PPE and you have avail have it available, because benzene can make you sick. It is in petroleum products. It's there. It's a hydrocarbon. Oil's a hydrocarbon. Gas is a hydrocarbon. It's just part of the game. And then make sure that you protect yourself if benzene is present. All right, our last topic of the day, norm and T-norm awareness. So if you know a little about norm, um, that's great because I'm going to go a little bit more in depth than most uh, awareness level trainings go. If you don't know anything, that's great because I'm going to you know, give you a, a lot of information about what it is and how to protect yourself. So norm is natural occurring radioactive material it is natural um, it's in the earth um, you could even consider the sun providing some amount of norm um, through radiation so radiation is essentially and we'll get into this a little bit later it's it's when an atom is essentially unstable and when it's unstable it can change uh, what it is to, to different things and typically when atoms and cells are changing that's bad for us that's not what we want. So whenever we remove pipe or fluid from the ground um, that has radiation, we can be exposed to it. It can cause problems. So that's just natural, right? It's in the ground already. There's unstable atoms in the ground from thousands of years of being down there. It happens over time. T-norm is when we enhance it technologically. So we do something to uh, the earth or to uh, the, the oil that we're working with or to the sand, and we enhance it. Uh, by pressurizing it, by um, pushing a lot of it in together, by doing something to it, we physically you know modify it. So um, this material is 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 typical in a lot of disposals where we have oil and gas moving consistently and water moving consistently. Different types of water moving. That's where we're typically going to find some T norm. So again, they're radioactive elements, and there's two different kinds, and we're going to get into that a little bit. But uh, essentially it accumulates over time and there are different people um, that are responsible to know about norm and T norm and tell people that it's there, test for it and then uh, ultimately protect people from it. So that's our job as leaders in, in the industry to do. So a little history and this is interesting I once you know, had a huge crush on this girl and she was in a play and I don't usually go to plays but I made an exception and lo and behold this play is about safety. So you know I was <laughs> about as happy as a person could be going into this play about safety. Um, and it was about uh, this, this Chicago uh, place called, uh, I think it was called Radium Laboratories. And uh, they made watches out of radium. So they actually took straight radium, uh, the gals in, the, in this uh, play, and this is actually historically accurate. It's true, true story. They would uh, take little paintbrushes and paint uh, the numbers and the watch faces on a watch back in the early 1900s and the late 1800s, and it would glow in the dark. Fantastic. Think of, think of how cool this is, right? Like, you got a watch that, without light, it just glows in the dark, right? Um, from just this chemical you licked and put on there, because it bonded the saliva really well, so they'd, you know, dip it in the radium. Um, they'd lick it first, dip it in the radium, and then um, put it onto the, onto the watch face. So these gals started getting real sick. Um, bone cancer, you know, like uh, stomach cancer, brain cancer, they're dropping like flies. Like, you know, in a 10 year period, I think there was like 50 or 60 women working in this warehouse and like 40 of them were done, either dead or out. It couldn't work anymore. Couldn't walk up the stairs. It was terrible. Uh, eventually brought a lawsuit against the company. He denied any wrongdoing said, you know, it's just, it's a fluke. You know, you have all these women dying. No one else around him is dying, just the women and their kids and families are getting sick too. Strange. Um, but it has nothing to do with us. They they proved the case. They won. Unfortunately, most of the women had died by the time they figured it out in about 1925. Um, but that's that's where it starts. So there is a there is a, a play about this out there. It's called Radium Girls. Uh, again, Saturday night. You know, look that up. 
Anyway, that's where it started. That's the history. That's kind of how we found out that norm and T-norm uh, radiation have these effects on us. So radium is the most common uh, thing that we uh, look for and test for. It is the most um, problematic for us as humans. Um, so there are testing things that we can do out there and is considered an ionizing radiation. Non-ionizing radiation is uh, it's a radiation that does not have su su sufficient enough energy to really do any, do any harm to us because it doesn't dislodge orbital electrons. Now, I, again, I'm not a chemist. It, this is not my, not my world. I'm definitely not a radio radiological chemist, but basically you don't want things dislodged from you. So we'll just put it that way. So these dislodging uh, uh, electrons cause problems in our body because they dislodge things in our body and break our body down. And that's non-ionizing things like, you know, microwaves, ultraviolet light, lasers, radio waves, infrared light, etc. Cell phone, you know, waves, we don't know yet. Maybe they are. Um, we're just kind of all guinea pigs on that. But ionizing radiation, we know it causes us problems. Alpha particles, beta particles, neutrons, gamma, and x-rays have these in them. And radium is obviously a physical uh, material that has this, it's emitting these from it. Um, so there's a background radiation. And I don't know why. When I first started in the oil field, my first job was actually dealing with radiation. That was my job. Like, here's a radioactive source. Put it in this tool. Send it down hole. It emits its radiation. That radiation bounces back at a certain point because when it hits water and soil, um, it, it reflects and returns, and then it gives us a map of the well. It's called logging. And in this training, this guy comes in. He, he clicks, turns on the TV, puts up his projector, whatever he's doing. Uh, starts clicking through, plays a video. And in this video, a guy takes one of these sources home for whatever reason. He put it in his pocket, thought it was a battery, I don't know. Takes it home, puts it in his, in his shirt pocket. I'll never forget this. Uh, gets home, uh, st wakes up in the middle of the night. It's like, man, man, baby, I'm sick. I don't, I don't feel good. My chest hurts. I take him to the doctor. The next scene is like blood and pus and just crazy stuff just shooting out of this guy's chest. And the doctor's worried and the boss is there and the wife's crying. It's, it's a whole mess. Turns the lights back on, turns off the TV, and is like, guys, listen. These sources are no more dangerous than walking through a sunflower field. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Why? How is this guy in the video dying, you know, like that horrifically? And you're telling us it's this. And it's this thing in uh, safety trainings about radiation. People always talk about sunflower fields. And I don't know if sunflowers emit some amount of radiation. They probably do. But... I don't know why they always use sunflower fields. So, you know, that's probably my pet peeve is when they talk about it being a safe. And who's walking through sunflower fields? Like, is, is this your senior photo shoot? Like, who's doing that? Anyway, I digress again. I know I'm going off on a lot of tangents with this topic, but it deserves some comic relief, you know? Um, so, yes, background radiation, there is some. Uh, typically 30 rem per year, cosmic radiation at sea level. You're higher up in the air, air's a little bit less dense, it's a little bit lighter, it's a little bit thinner, you're going to get a little bit more. So at about 10,000 feet, you're going to experience about 140 rem per year from cosmic radiation. Now, the average oil field worker were allowed, or oil field, you know, people working around radiation were around to be around 5,000 rem per year, just to, or M rem, M rem, not rem, rem, it, it's essentially a, a, a thousandth of, of that, so just keep that in mind, the M is a thousand, so... Uh, anyway, it's uh, it, it's significantly higher. It's not the same as it is definitely not the same as walking through a sunflower field. I'll tell you that. Um, here it is in the oil and gas industry. Um, it's it's an oil, gas, and mixed production. It just it's there. So obviously in our region, uh, a high crude oil region, we're not really we like the gas. Uh, they're using it to mine Bitcoin now. Cruso uh, is out there. I know Kraken's using them for one company. There's a few others. Pretty pretty cool stuff. Um, we don't have a lot of natural gas. It's not our main thing. In other areas, it is a higher uh, gas production field. You can see that represented here. It's also where the norm is. So it can be in the gas. It can be in the oil. Uh, it can be mixed. And uh, it's, it's, it's higher in southeast Texas, as you see there, a lot higher in Pennsylvania, uh, Ohio, West Virginia, um, even over in Indiana and Illinois, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee. Um, yeah, I know, I know my states actually, um, I, I can actually draw, anyway, it doesn't matter. I can, I can draw the, the, the states mostly from memory. I know again, lots of, lots of friends, just tons of them. Um, all right. Half-life, uh, half-life with radiation, um, is essentially everything has a half-life, right? Like cells have a half-life, uh, radiation is how we determine 
the strength of, 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 an, of an atom or a nucleus that is radioactive and how long it takes to break down. So we use that in half-life. I think, you know, uh, certain things, and again, we're talking about ain't the reason crude oil, been down there for a long time, right? Long, long time. Some people say 10,000 years, 100,000 years, millions, six, who knows, a long time. And it, some of that stuff hasn't broken down all the way yet, and that is what we get up when we produce natural oil and gas. Again, it's unstable uh, electrons. So uh, a few different things. It's essentially, it's, it's a wave. Uh, that's important to know. Um, uranium is a type of ionizing radiation. And when it breaks down, and it, it essentially tears atoms apart, so if you've seen, you know, anything about Fukushima, uh, Hiroshima, um, different areas where it's either been a nuclear disaster or a, a nuclear weapon, uh, the danger here is that it like literally rips things apart, and uh, that's that's bad for for us. We don't want things to be dislodged, but we even have a natural amount of radioactive elements in our body. It's just it's kind of a part of living. Uh, it's what breaks us down, or part of what breaks us down over time is just what it is. Most atoms, however, are stable. Uh, but the ones that are unstable, again, um, they can completely change elements. Uranium will turn to lead. Um, some people believe that sunlight through process radiation turns into hydrogen. Light turn ch completely changes uh, from its original form. Um, and then we also get things like gamma, uh, alpha, and beta particles, or rays. Um, they're they're kind of synonymous. So on the norm side, these just happen. They're part of, you know, you pump out salt water, there's going to be some amount of norm. Usually it's negligible. It's not even going to show up on your on your meter, so we don't have to worry about it. But when we do things, we frack, right? We we pressure. Sometimes we'll send radioactive material uh, down into the earth. Then we're going to get back higher levels. And then even in smaller amounts, though, it, it comes through a production system. Over time, it's going to collect and um, accumulate in the pipe, and then you're going to get higher levels than is just natural in, like, you know, just a, a, a gallon of, of salt water or oil. And that's where we're going to see it in, in filters, in piping, in tanks, in treaters, uh, disposals. That's where you're going to see this stuff. So um, ionizing, we have typically uh, four or three different types of rays that we look at, alpha, beta, and gamma. Um, alpha can be stopped by a piece of paper, right? Beta can be stopped by aluminum, and then gamma can go through a lot of stuff, um, but it needs to penetrate a dense material, such as a human being or lead, um, to be stopped. And obviously, if we're the thing that's stopping it, that's bad, because then it's staying in us, and we don't want things dislodging our electrons inside of our body. So, uh, you know, there's different, this, this chart here, not really my bailiwick goes very in depth into different types of uh, amounts of radiation out there in the world, but note that a lot of them are in the ground, and then there are, um, you know, um, inhalation. Uh, we do inhale them, and they're, they're atmospheric. So we're going to go into testing and screening for T-norm and norm. So there's a few different uh, items that we use. Um, essentially, there's, there's a survey uh, a method that we use. And, um, you know, typically we use the Ludlum uh, meter for this. Uh, essentially tests for radiation and gives us readings. And there's different types of readings you can get, right? You can get REM readings. You can get um, gamma ray readings. You can get all kinds of different readings just depending on the type of instrument that you get. But essentially you use these. You'll test trucks. You'll test facility piping and equipment. You'll test filter stock and determine the level of norm or T-norm in them. Once you find that, there's a process. Like, okay, this we got to get cleaned out got to take it to the proper disposal. Um, we have to, you know, fence this area off and say, yes, this is a norm area. So that we're not just out there, you know, again, you know, smoking a cigarette, leaning on the pipe, hanging out, talking to Billy about the game. Uh, we want to be in a safe area, not in an area where our innards are being dislodged. Makes pretty much logical sense, right? I hope. So there is a more in-depth training. This is the awareness level, right? I'm giving you the very basics about norm and T-norm. There is a 40-hour course for radiation safety ops training. And a bunch of courses in, in intermediately uh, between here and there. If you are working around norm, I'm hoping, and you know it, I'm hoping you've been through a little bit more of an in-depth class than that. But for the rest of us, it is here. Uh, it's at disposals. Uh, it's at production facilities. Anywhere where you have oil and natural gas moving through a production system, there's going to be some amount of norm. It's not a question of if. It's a question of how much. Just like benzene, just like H2S. It's going to be everywhere. So a lot of that's going to be training. 
different if you are in a company that works around norm or is in the process of, of dealing with norm then you will have certain responsibilities as a worker as a supervisor or in a management position so make sure you understand those responsibilities the federal government takes them very seriously as well as the uh, Department of Environmental Quality so keep that in mind here's an example of what norm uh, can look like inside of a, a water uh, pipe here so this is a, a coal water um, uh, system here and you have radiation in there and it can look like anything you know just your regular scale I mean I live in Williston uh, I've got a water softener if I don't use that if water dries in a glass it's like bright white you know it's a little bit disconcerting I'm not gonna lie I probably need to do a little bit better um, water processing Wilson if you're listening to this I'm sure the city of Wilson's checking out my YouTube channel but uh, uh, yeah radiums out there um, it exists it hardens it becomes a part of the system and then that pipe obviously needs to be disposed of in a proper way we don't want to just dump that in someone's backyard uh, because it's going to be emitting uh, it in the atmosphere here's an example of a pipe that has been overcome by scale uh, that is radioactive and there's a couple of different ways as I mentioned you can use your love blow meter you can you know kind of wave it over the pipe and say oh you know we got we got so many ren uh, that we found here um, or you can actually take a sample of the scale send it into the lab and they're going to give you exactly how much is in there and depending on your level of work with radiation that may be required so where is it going to be found again production water equipment oil equipment gas equipment piping uh, pumps filters storage holding tanks treaters tank bottoms pumps separators piping well heads anywhere where there's piping and equipment you're going to find norm potentially uh, here's here's kind of a picture of where it can be found basically anywhere at a gas plant it can be in the stills um, you know, it can be in your in your low cap buildings it can be um, in a lot of different places so protecting employees from norm again uh, cordoning off areas is important letting people know where it is um, and then there's you know I mentioned not you know being around the norm area you know hanging out talking about the game um, you want to there's three ways to protect yourself it's the good old TDS and no that is not STD that's something you get if you're not up on Saturday night watching, you know, safety videos. You're doing other stuff. No, I'm just kidding. TDS is time distance shielding. So uh, minimum amount of time is possible we want to spend around radiation. We want to increase our distance to the maximum amount possible. And we want to have as much shielding as we can as possible to protect ourselves. And this is something we also call the ALARA principle in norm and T-norm, which is low as reasonably possible um, or allowable achievable um, essentially we want to prevent people from being exposed but we do know that we have to work around radiation I mean it, it's naturally occurring for goodness sake like there's nothing you can do about it we can't prevent it but what can we do to keep that exposure to is, is uh, the least possible uh, amount so PPE is effective um, but candidly time distance and shielding are the best thing um, when I worked uh, for the wireline outfit they didn't give me like a shield to walk around in but they did give me this uh, uh, long stick uh, with a threaded end, and you'd stick it into this thing that looked like, you know, Back to the Future, like radioactive, you know, canister. You stick it in there, you grab the source, you'd tighten that thread in, pick it up, stick it into the tool, um, unthread it, you know, close the tool, um, you know, you put a screw in there, set screw, and then send it down hole. So we were around radiation pretty close, and that was about a foot and a half long, uh, um, you know, um, uh, tool there so I'm, I'm not sure our, our distance was as great as we'd want it to be but at least they didn't make it pick it up with our hands so that was that was a, a small mercy there but yes time distance and shielding is the way that we protect ourselves from radiation PPE yes you can wear gloves full body suits uh, face shields and respirators but it's going right through all that stuff unless it's all lead lead will hold it out but I don't know a lot of guys working with lead suits on that's not your your typically daily attire so that's a little bit um, you know, a little bit of the problem we kind of went through what the effect on cells and how much were uh, how much what the dose were around uh, the total the dose rate meaning how you know how much at a time the quality of the radiation which you know you don't typically think about it in those terms but higher quality radiation higher quality problems um, and then also the stage of development of that radioactive electron at the time that you're exposed to it that has a lot to do with how long it was underground and how far into its half-life is it and a lot of things that we're not just going to know um, naturally all right so how do you know if you've been exposed to radiation um, you know again 
from my uh, you know story about the video, if your chest is uh, concaving and blood and pus are spouting out, you probably were exposed to a lot. Less than that, I'm just like benzene and all this other stuff, uh, COVID included. You're you're gonna start feeling sick. You're gonna have a headache. You're gonna feel nauseous. You're gonna uh, have a nose, uh, you know, uh, a nosebleed or a nose running. You're not going to be able to sleep. So again, if you've had a cold for six months, uh, get checked out. And there's a variety of things that you might need to get checked out for. And that's why it's important to have a plan and for your company to be testing for radiation. So some different shielding examples out there. Um, um, essentially, our, our typical um, amount again is about 5,000 for the whole body, 15,000 for the eye, 50,000 for shallow at the skin level or 50 rem or 50,000 rem, uh, mrem, minors 0.5 or 500 and the pregnant workers 0.5 or 500, which is essentially what we know that we're just exposed to, right? Because everyone's exposed to about 100 per year uh, on average. Um, but yeah, 5,000 is, or fifth, five rem is about what the maximum we can be exposed to over the course of a year. Now, again, the way we know that, just like the benzene, are little badges. So you wear the badge, charcoal, or other medium. Um, it's just exposed to the air, you know, and it's going to collect any radiation that's uh, it's exposed to. You send it into a lab, they dissolve uh, the medium, uh, they test it for how much radium or, you know, other types of rays are in there, and then they give you a readout. So when I worked for the wireline company, they'd send us those. They'd send us a report and say, hey, this is how much radiation you were exposed to. Good luck. You know, hope you got a good insurance plan. Um, and, yeah, I'll be honest with you. Like, when I worked there, I had a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of like, tremors. Um, you know, you typically get, if, you know, like, um, uh, you typically get if you don't eat enough potassium. Um, so, you know, I definitely started to notice some effects. Um, so... Labeling for this is also important, as we went through with the uh, the GHS and Hascom. It needs to say caution or danger, natural occurring radioactive materials, uh, little radioactive symbol, etc., to let us know, hey, this is a dangerous thing. So, obviously, again, uh, we don't want pipe in backyards. Any fluids that have norm, uh, that truck needs to be labeled, and we want to make sure it gets to a proper disposal site. If you're working around radiation, you want to frisk in. And frisk out, which basically means like leave your norm stuff at the norm site. Do not take it home with you. So unlike decon, which we do in certain cases, we just leave it. We ain't trying to clean it. Ain't gonna work. You just leave it where you're at. Um, transportation. There is a license for transportation of norm. You have to do that the appropriate way. Um, and there's a bunch of rules and regulations for it. Um, you have to you know pay the fee and follow procedure, etc. We're not just you know willy nilly. Um, just moving norm and T-norm uh, around. There's a process for it. Kind of wrapping up here, disposal. Uh, again, to dispose of norm, you have to have a license. Uh, there's a protocol to follow. The workers that work at those disposals have to uh, be trained and have to kind of know how to test and, and what the samples mean and how to protect themselves, how to make sure it goes down correctly. We're not just dumping it into the lake. Um, those are all uh, requisites for handling norm and T-norm. So that's all we got, um, as always, or about every um, uh, third training here. I like to put this out there. We are, you know, based in safety, we are a training firm, and we like to, you know, give back a little bit. You have to sit through, you have to hear my voice, my terrible stories, my, my bad, worst jokes. Um, so we want to give you a rifle. So the way we do that is you can go to Google or Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Glassdoor, Yelp if you want to, and you put in, you know, basically find us, based in safety consulting. Uh, in training, find us, put a uh, little blurb in there, you know, tell, tell us you liked us, tell us you hated us, don't tell us you hated us because it'll hurt our feelings, but no, uh, tell, uh, you know, tell the world what you think about the training, and then we put all of those names into a hat for uh, uh, a rifle at the end of the year, or a shotgun, and then also we're giving away some black gold uh, clothing, so I uh, look forward to seeing your review, I uh, hope you have a great day, and be safe out there.